Welcome to a brief discussion of the phenomenon of resonance as it applies to chemistry. Let's begin with a quick review. Most of the structures that we show you for molecules and ions in your books and in YouTube videos and things like that are really just snapshots of a single potential state for that molecule or ion. And oftentimes that state doesn't even really exist. And the way that we cope with this is showing resonance. Now pi electrons, we know, aren't held as tightly in bonds as their sigma counterparts are. We know that the energy of a pi bond for, let's say, a carbon-carbon pi bond is only about half that of a carbon-carbon sigma bond. So those electrons, they have more ability to roam. Now pi electrons also can move into adjacent p orbitals as long as they're properly aligned. So these electrons, being free to move, can jump from one atom to another or from one bond to another as long as the orbital alignment is uh, adequate or correct. And finally, the real driving force behind resonance. Electrons don't like to be confined. An electron will be very happy to have lots of space to move and be free. So an electron with a large volume of space in which it can move is a happy electron. But if you confine that electron, it's going to get unhappy. So given a chance, electrons will assume a larger volume of space in which they're moving. And this is what resonance really provides, is that larger volume of space for electrons to move around in and be happy. So when do we need to invoke this phenomenon of resonance? Well, the simple answer is, whenever a single Lewis structure fails to adequately characterize a species, and by species I mean a molecule or ion. A classic example of this is the bicarbonate ion. HCO3 minus, which I've drawn here, but I can also draw a duplicate Lewis structure and then do a quick rearrangement so that the negative charge is on a different oxygen, and yet I haven't really changed the identity of this ion. So the truth about bicarbonate ion is somewhere in between these two different structures that I've drawn. And when this is true, we call these structures resonance contributors. So let's go through some rules for drawing resonance contributors. First, lone pairs and pi electrons are free to move and even interchange. So pi electrons can become lone pairs and lone pairs can become pi electrons. However, all sigma bonds have to remain in place. We can't break a sigma bond because that would mean breaking a bond between two atoms completely. And in doing so, we've changed the identity of that species. When drawing resonance contributors, atoms are allowed to have less than an octet of electrons. But what you can never do for row 1 and 2 elements is expand their octet, because they simply don't have the atomic orbitals available to hold that many electrons. So even though we can draw things that have only, say, 6 electrons in their valence shell, we can't draw a species that has 10 valence electrons, as long as we're dealing with row 1 and 2 elements. Exceptions exist for things like sulfur, uh, but for the usual suspects in organic chemistry, we never exceed an octet. Okay, so now that we know our rules for resonance and uh, when to apply them, let's try a simple organic molecule. Here's a molecule of propenal. And I've drawn it as a neutral structure in which we have all of our atoms having zero formal charge, everything has an octet, it looks like a very happy, very stable structure. But this is actually not how propenal looks. Notice that all of the atoms are sp2 hybridized. This means that there's a larger pi system here through which electrons can move and shift to create resonance contributors. So if I want a better idea of how propenal is going to behave chemically, I'm going to have to look at each resonance contributor and then mentally construct a resonance hybrid. Now I'm going to draw three different resonance contributors for propenal. Okay, remember our rules here. Sigma bonds cannot be changed, so I've highlighted those in black. But pi bonds and lone pairs are in play, so I've highlighted those in white. And as usual, I'm going to separate resonance contributors using double-headed arrows. So on the left, let's create a resonance contributor in which we shift the pi bonds from the carbonyl 
up onto the oxygen. You see what we've done here? We haven't violated the octet rule, but we've separated some charge. The oxygen is now negative and the adjacent carbon now positive. So this is definitely higher in energy than a completely neutral molecule, but it still is a resonance contributor. Similarly, in the center molecule, I'm going to shift the carbonyl, but I'm also going to shift the alkene pi bond as well. And you can see that in doing this, I've placed the positive charge at the other end of the molecule instead of on the adjacent carbon. Now I'm going to leave my third resonance contributor as the intact neutral molecule because this is also a resonance contributor. So if I want a good idea of how this molecule will actually behave, as a chemist, what I'm trained to do is build the resonance hybrid in my head. And essentially to do this, I'm going to take these three resonance contributors and recombine them. And in doing so, I can see that there are regions of the molecule with positive charge density and regions of the molecule with negative charge density. And this is going to help me with things like predicting the chemical shifts of the protons and carbons in the molecule. And also locating nucleophilic and electrophilic sites. And more than this, there's lots of potential uses for these resonance hybrids. So this is how we go from a neutral structure to a set of resonance contributors and ultimately to a resonance hybrid, which gives us a better idea of how molecules will act. That's all for now. I'll see you next time.